Welcome. Uh, will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this ability to, to be here in your word, whether we're here in the church or at home on the computer or sitting with family and friends on the TV or in a small group. I just thank you for this uh, opportunity to share your word and to learn from, from you and to have your Holy Spirit in our lives. So thank you, Lord. I pray that the message I give today will, will honor you, will glorify you, will be the words you want me to use, and that the message will, will speak to each of us in a way that you have designed for our lives. I just pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, welcome back to our service. Um, we're doing online services still. I pray that very shortly we'll be back to a collective body of believers in the church. But until that happens, we're going to use the uh, technology that God has given us the ability to create to, uh, to go ahead and, and spread the message of Jesus throughout to whoever can listen to it. We're continuing our study today in the Beatitudes. And last week we, uh, we heard the, the first two Beatitudes. And uh, they were, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And today, we're going to look at the third and fourth blessings as found in Matthew 5, verses 5 through 6. 5 and 5 through 6 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And today I'll be reading out of the ESV, but also using the NLT to compare some of the things that both, uh, both versions have. Now, before we talk about these two blessings, I want to point out a few things about the Beatitudes. And the first thing I want to point out is that it may sound countercultural to us today. It may sound a little crazy. It may sound that this isn't what society wants us to do. But not only is it countercultural today, I'm here to tell you that 2,000 years ago, when Jesus first spoke these words, it was countercultural then too. Nothing has changed. Society and culture wants to push us one way, and the truth is something completely different. And second, that as strange as these teachings were from Jesus, it wasn't new. There was nothing that Jesus spoke about that hadn't already been presented in the Tanakh and what we consider the Old Testament. These were the words of God before Jesus came to earth and spoke them to his people. Jesus was just relaying to them what the truth really was and reminding them what the foundation of their, their faith would be, that these were the things that had always been true and always would be true. See, it wasn't that God was, was there and had presented something different. Now Jesus was presenting something new because we know that God doesn't change. All that Jesus was going to do was teach what Scripture had already taught. And God's word was the same yesterday as it is today, as it's going to be forever. In Malachi 3, 6, we hear this. I am the Lord and I do not change. And that is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. God's word doesn't change. Our situation doesn't change. Technology changes. Sometimes the environment changes, but God is forever. So the first blessing I want to look at today is Matthew 5, 5. And this is the third of the Beatitudes, but it's the first one we're going to look at today. It says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Or in the NLT, and that was ESV, in the NLT it says, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. Now this idea of being meek or humble, it, it's an ability to have patience and perseverance and the ability to learn under pressure and under difficult situations. It also refers to a person who does not consider himself or herself better than others. It's someone that has complete lack of superiority complex. It's someone who places others above themselves. Meekness is not weakness. It's quite the opposite, actually. To be meek means that you're able to internalize and take things and put others in front of you, put others above you, and press on. It's an attitude that always places others above self. And as I said, even though what Jesus spoke sounded controversial, he spoke from the Old Testament. Those Jews that were listening to him, if they had any knowledge of Scripture, what the Tanakh, what they would call they understood these words. They knew that he was speaking the truth. And this particular beatitude comes to us from Psalms. This is Psalm 37, verse 11. And it says, But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. It is exactly what Jesus was speaking in the beatitudes on that Sermon on the Mount. He was re reminding them that the meek will inherit the land, that God had already promised it. And God doesn't see meekness as a detriment. No, far from it. 
I'm here to tell you that it's a quality he desires in us. Think about maybe one of the most important prophets that the Jewish faith and Christianity has. One of the most important. Moses. Moses was a meek man. In fact, Numbers 12, verse 3 tells us this. He says, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. That's a big statement. Not only was he meek, but he was to the extreme that no one else could compare in how meek or humble he was. And this is what God said of Moses in the very same chapter, just a few verses later. This is Numbers 12, verses 6 through 8. This is the word of the Lord. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. Of all of my house, he is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. This meek man, this man that was more humble than anyone on the face of the earth was a friend of God. God honored him by showing him, by speaking to him as a friend, by not hiding in riddles or parables. He spoke directly to Moses because he loved him, he trusted him, and Moses was a humble and meek man. So have you ever personally encountered someone that was meek or humble? There may be a few that you know of in your family or friends, but if you go to those that maybe are famous, if we think of people that are, are actors or athletes or musicians, usually the term meek does not fit into their description. In fact, I think we'd probably describe them as maybe bold or unyielding, brave, maybe a little disobedient because that's what attracts us to them. Because that's what makes them so interesting to watch, is that they buck culture. They go away from what everyone says is right and wrong, and they just do their own thing as an individual. But every once in a while, every once in a while, you hear about a famous person that is down to earth, that is friendly, that is kind and compassionate, someone that is truly humble. And when I think of that person in today's culture, um, recent people, I would think of maybe someone like Tim Tebow. And I'm not here to debate on what you think of him as an athlete. That's not what we're here for today. But I've heard that he's humble. And I don't know him personally. I've never spoke to him. I don't know what he's like uh, face to face. But I have read accounts about him. And I have read about how he acts when people are around and when people aren't around. And in 2012, a Fox News reporter had this to say about him after winning a very big game. These are the words of the reporter. Uh, it's been condensed for time, but it says, Tebow came out for a post-game presser in a knit cap and vest, jeans and sneakers. He offered praise to God. He spoke of how privileged he was to spend time before the game with Bailey Knob, a 16-year-old who has endured 73 surgeries battling a rare disease that attacks vital organs, and he credited his teammates. That was pretty much the entire interview that they had and I want you to, to think about what wasn't inside of that interview Tim Tebow never spoke about how great he was he never placed blame on someone else in their performance he never said it was about him he never put the focus on himself but there are a couple of things in this that I did see and I did hear that really speak to being humble Tebow spoke about his teammates and he appreciated how they worked Tebow talked about how he was honored to be with someone that was less fortunate than him and above all Tim Tebow spoke about his appreciation and honor for God and that praise to God is everything because that's what it means to be meek it means to be humble. It means to be a servant of Christ. And true humbleness can only come from a relationship with Jesus. In Matthew 23, Jesus said this, verses 11 through 12. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Now there's another great man that we all know of who was meek and humble, even though he was powerful. I'm talking about a man that could heal sickness. 
I'm talking about a man that could cast out demons. I'm talking about a man who could raise those from the dead. Jesus is the epitome of meekness. That doesn't mean he was weak. It doesn't mean that, that he would follow the crowd because that was the easy route. No, he was very strong, but he was humble. Listen to the words of Paul found in Philippians 2. In verses 4 through 11, Paul says this. Let each of you look not unto his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And have this, uh, in, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking a form of a, the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus showed humbleness, and that is one of the reasons, along with many others, but he was humble, and because of that, he will be exalted forever. And when we show humbleness, God is pleased. So myself, when I start to feel pride take over, I need to remind myself of what Jesus said. I need to pray for humility. I need to pray to be more humble. I need to pray to be meek. I need to pray to be like Jesus. And know that that's where my strength will be. The second blessing from our text today is found in Matthew 5. Verse 6, and it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's the ESV. And in the NLT, it says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Now, once again, Jesus is reminding all of those followers of what has already been spoken in the Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament, but in Scripture, this is what they already knew. Here's just a few verses that speak to that very blessing Jesus gave. Psalm 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. Psalm 55, 22, Cast your burdens on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Psalm 119, verse 1, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And finally in Proverbs Chapter 21, verse 21, we read this. Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. See, we're called to be righteous. And this idea of being righteous is to be fair, to be good, to be just, to have honor, to have virtue. It also means a devotion to a sinless life. It means to put away those things that, that are sinful or not of God. It, has, it means to have holiness, to be pious. It means to have devotion and devoutness and godliness, reverence and spirituality. It means to try to be like Jesus. And this is the opposite of what the world says we need to be. Society tells us that our traits that we should follow, that the traits that, that we should go towards are things like apathy or indifference or blasphemy or being impetuous or reverent. Anything that they consider desirable is what God says we shouldn't be. And even though they're considered fun and independent thinkers for doing the w things they do, these people aren't leading us towards Christ. They're leading us away from him. See, the world is trying to teach these traits as free thinking, but all they're teaching us is sinful thinking. Romans 6 reminds us how we're supposed to live. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. See, godly righteousness is going to be different than what we sometimes think of righteousness because we think of self-righteousness, and self-righteousness places, places the focus on us, on individuals, as the, as the pillar for what makes us righteous. And self-righteous 
claims that we can be good because of our deeds. Self-righteous claims that we can be good because of who we are. Self-righteous claims that we're probably better than others. Self-righteous claims that because of who I am, I am righteous, and I don't need God to do that. But when I think of that, I'm reminded of the Pharisee and the tax collector who were praying. And I remember how the Pharisee prayed that he was so thankful he was not like the tax collector, that he was someone who tithed and who was someone who prayed and did all the right things. But I'm here to tell you the Pharisee wasn't praying to God. The Pharisee was boasting to God. The Pharisee wasn't looking for righteousness in, in God. The Pharisee was proving his righteousness to God. And that's sin. Boasting isn't righteous. Being humble is being righteous. And when you're righteous, you become humble. And if you're like me, you can find yourself kind of gravitating towards that self-righteousness. For me, it happens probably when I'm at home with my family or at work with others or in groups with people because that's human nature. I find myself comparing myself to others and thinking, well, I wouldn't be like that person or I wouldn't do what he has done because I'm better than that. But here's the secret. I'm not better than that. You're not better than that. None of us as individuals are better than that. Only through Christ can we be better because we can't just rely on our own strengths and our own perfection. That's not where righteousness is found. Luckily, if you're like me, when you start to become self-righteous, then you usually trip and fall on your own sinful behavior and are quickly reminded that you are no better than the rest. It happens quite often to myself, and I'm thankful it does, because otherwise I could continue to put myself on a pedestal. See, godly righteousness admits that we can never be righteous on our own. Godly righteousness acknowledges that we can only be righteous through Christ because we know where our power comes from. Godly righteousness accepts Jesus and accepts his will for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now every time I read that scripture, I, uh, I get Chris Tomlin stuck in my head and stuck in my heart as well. And right now I'm probably singing Jesus Messiah to myself. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross, Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus, Messiah, the name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus, Messiah, Lord of all. And I, I really, really wish I could sing this for you today, but I know the strength that God has given me, and I know the blessings that that he has chose not to give to me and at this point i'm going to bless both of us by not trying to sing but back to my point back to where we get our righteousness righteousness is through jesus his sinless life his accepting our sin on a cross and dying took away our sin and he rose again to be our Lord and Savior and that's where our righteousness comes from when we accept Christ he gives us the Holy Spirit to both guide us and to remind us of what we are and, and what we're doing this is all part of what we call sanctification it's becoming more like Christ and it is righteousness in Christ it's not righteousness in front of Christ see our sim our sinful human nature gravitates to self above others it always will it always will and society convinces us that we must always have more we must always be more there's always more to achieve there's always more toys to get but that's not where our value is found see our, our blessings shouldn't come from material things our blessings don't come from idols our blessings come from the father through Jesus, and we pray in the Spirit to him.
because Jesus reminds us in this sermon that our blessings, they come from God only. And he blesses those that have the qual- these qualities in their lives. And these qualities aren't just things we do. These qualities are who we are. It's who we are because of who Jesus is. Once again, I want to thank Chris Tomlin for putting a song into my head and, and singing it into my heart. Um, I think he summed it up beautifully when he sang, Good, Good Father. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. For that's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. As the song says, it's who I am only because of who Jesus is. And it's through Jesus that we become more like him. It's through Jesus that we become humble. And it's through Jesus that we seek righteousness. And we know that these are so intertwined that the humble are the righteous and the righteous will become humble. And I pray that throughout this week we continue to lift our eyes towards God and take away our own self-righteousness and humble ourselves before the Lord because he will lift us up. Will you pray with me? Lord God, I thank you so much for your message today. I thank you for your son Jesus who died on a cross for our sins, knowing that there was nothing I could ever do to save myself. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you that you came to earth to teach us and to show to us perfection before you went to that cross i I thank you for not just the salvation that we receive but the sanctification that we can also get by studying your word and following you and following your holy spirit i thank you lord that you've given us this message i thank you that you've given us this opportunity to to study it and i pray that it will be written on our hearts that we will take something from this and and uh, continue to change our lives and until the day that we come back as a, a body of believers here in this church i pray that you continue to give us the opportunity to spread your word and to reach those that are still lost and i pray all this in the precious name of jesus my lord and savior amen